this definitely uh, picked up my attention and I quite enjoyed speedrunning. Well, Zamad, you you are no uh, you are no stranger to IGN. Now we've had you on several times, and <laughs> yeah, it's uh, been very cool. I, I hope this isn't this. the last time. I, I yeah. can't imagine it would be. Uh, Jay Hobbs, where can we find you after this? Uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at j underscore hobbs, uh, or on Twitch at twitch.tv slash j hobbs two nine six. Uh, gotta get that shortened, but somebody's claimed Jay Hobbs. It's annoying. Uh, <laughs> but also I wanted to, to shout out, I do a, a weekly show on the games done quick channel. So that's twitch.tv slash games done quick every Thursday at 7 PM Eastern, uh, called the first step with my good buddy keys on highly recommend that, uh, if you are interested in speed running, if you saw this and you thought like you would want to try it out yourself or something like that, uh, and maybe you think that speed running is really hard to get into. You got to spend hours upon hours upon hours. That's not where where speedrunners get started. Everybody gets started at mm -hmm. kind of the same place. And uh, we really like to show on the first step what it takes to uh, become a speedrunner, just taking that first step and trying to go fast. So I highly recommend tuning into that. And uh, of course, you know, SGDQ, Summer Games Done Quick, is moving online this year, and it's going to be August 16th to the 23rd. So be sure to check that out. GamesDoneQuick.com can give you more info for that too. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for coming. $5,120 raised. That's awesome. And now it is time for the moment that we've all been speed running towards. It's time for our first ever IGN Expo. You're about to see a ton of exclusive trailers and first looks. We've got three more of these showcases in the coming days as Summer of Gaming continues, not to mention more charity speed runs, major announcements from the biggest game developers like Blizzard, Sony, and EA, and of course, special editions of your favorite IGN shows, including a few fun surprises. For more Summer of Gaming goodness, download the TikTok app and follow IGN. Check out IGN Summer of Gaming hashtag, where you can watch along with live events and submit your own Summer of Gaming moments, reactions, and plays. So make sure to check out the full schedule wherever you stream IGN or on channel IGN1 on your Samsung TV+. Plus. Last but not least, feel free to leave us a Yappa video comment at IGN.com and you could wind up on the stream. Guys, IGN Expo Day 1 starts in just a moment. But first, our editor-in-chief, Tina Amini, with a message from all of us here at IGN. Welcome to IGN's Summer of Gaming live stream event. Before we kick things off with the debut of IGN Expo, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the unprecedented difficult times we're facing as a global community right now. Between the COVID-19 pandemic that has claimed over 400,000 lives and changed our lifestyles. And the unrest of a society fed up with police brutality and systemic racism toward black people. The country and the world are hurting. We at IGN have been promoting health and safety tips as well as charity drives to help people through the coronavirus since the stay at home orders were initiated. Across our Summer of Gaming event specifically will be fundraising for the World Health Organization. We've also been vocal about our support of Black Lives Matter since protests erupted across the U.S. due to the heartbreaking death of George Floyd under the knee of a Minneapolis police officer now charged with murder. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives. Black Lives. Black Lives. Black Lives Matter in an effort to make sure that our actions speak louder than our words. We've been focused on driving donations to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Across Summer of Gaming, we'll also be fundraising for the Bail Project. We hope you'll join us in an effort to promote change, both for our health as well as our society. And thank you for watching. Summer is here. It's the time to get up close with the biggest games headed our way, along with first looks at what next-gen consoles have to offer. And if you want non-stop coverage, IGN is the place to be. Welcome to Summer of Gaming, a multi-day streaming event jam-packed with huge reveals, jaw-dropping new trailers, exclusive gameplay footage, and our first looks at what next-gen holds for the future of gaming. Today, we're checking out never-before-seen demos of highly anticipated titles. We'll be facing a stampede of evil mutant velociraptors in Second Extinction, then descending into madness in the punishing nightmare hellscape, exclusive gameplay reveal of Mortal Shell. As well as dropping exclusive announcements and brand new trailers you won't find anywhere else. Sit back, relax, the very first IGN Expo starts now.
Peggy 18. <laughs> You just watched the trailer for Werewolf the Apocalypse Earthblood, which you can currently wishlist on Epic Game Store. Go check it out and stay tuned into updates by following Werewolf Apocalypse on social media or joining the official Earthblood Discord. Welcome to IGN Expo number one, our own summer of gaming showcase packed with exclusive trailers, brand new gameplay, developer interviews, and a whole lot of other buzzwords I think I already said in that sizzle reel at the top. I'm Max Goble and I'm here with Sydney Goodman and Brian Altano. And apologies if you don't like our faces because you are going to be seeing a lot of them. And also we can't do anything about them. But what we can do about those faces and with those faces is use them to tell you that this is just the first of four epic IGN Expos that we have planned. So make sure to check back for regular updates on the latest in gaming. You can watch us wherever you stream IGN or live on your TVs by tuning in to IGN One on your Samsung TV Plus. Additionally, all summer of gaming long, IGN is asking you to give to the World Health Organization and the Bail Project. The COVID-19 Response Fund is dedicated to studying, tracking, and combating the coronavirus pandemic. The Bail Project is a nonprofit that pays bail for people in need, reuniting families and restoring the perception of innocence. And by donating, you'll have a chance to win codes for games like Resident Evil 3 and swag from companies like Bethesda. Be sure to click the donation links in the description of your video player or go to donate.ign.com for more information on how and where to donate. Keep those donations coming. For even more Summer of Gaming goodness, download the TikTok app, follow IGN, and check out the Summer of Gaming hashtag on Twitter, where you can watch along with live events, submit your own Summer of Gaming moments, reactions, and plays. And now, let's get this thing rolling with what you're all here for, some world premiere video game trailers. World premiere. You ever wonder how it all ends? What if it ended with a song?
enjoy this. Crossplay. All platforms. I've been looking forward to this day my entire life. The moment we finally blend our worlds into one. There were no people to be seen. They're not exactly people, they're gods. Hey Sydney, do you hate dinosaurs? Do you ever want to shoot them in the face with a bazooka but you can't because they're extinct and also you don't own a bazooka? Well, great news because in Second Extinction, dinos are back and you can shoot them in the face with a bazooka to your heart's content in this co-op action first-person shooter by Systemic Reaction. My friend Max sat down with one of the game's developers to find out more. Did he find out if they kiss? No, but I will. Mm. Ryan, you're so weird. <laughs> Well, bad news, everybody. Mutant dinosaurs have overtaken the Earth, and it's up to you and two friends to take them on in Second Extinction. Here to tell them about this new game where you shoot a whole lot of dinosaurs is lead producer Brindley Gibson. Brindley, welcome. Hi, Max. Great to be here. So Second Extinction is a three-player three cooperative shooter where there are just a really an absurd amount of dinosaurs running around. Uh, you guys unveiled this on the most recent sort of Microsoft Series X uh, sort of live stream, uh, and it's really, it's kind of showing off the, the the power of the Series X. Everyone is extremely excited about next gen. Can you talk a little bit about some of the bells and whistles that this game is showing off on, on the new hardware? Well, uh, we're not really announcing every single detail of sort of the features we're supporting uh, for the next gen at the moment, uh, but obviously it gives us a lot of power, uh, and our ultimate aim is to ensure a great silky smooth SPS experience and get more carnage onto the screen. And see our heritage uh, from the Avalanche Studios group is these kind of uh, games with crazy things going on. Uh, and that's essentially what it allows us to do, just push that and get more of that action onto the screen for players. Now, I had to get that out of the way. Everyone always wants to talk about next gen and, you know, this this time of the, the console generation. But let's let's talk about the game. This is this is a game where mutant dinosaurs have taken over the earth and humans have to sort of fight to survive. Uh, can you give us a little sort of rundown of uh, how humanity wound up in this horrible situation? Well, when we join the story, uh, we don't really know exactly what happened. Um, time has moved on since the actual extinction event occurred and some of humanity has escaped to the stars. Uh, it really came out of nowhere. These dinosaurs erupted out of the ground. It looked like they'd been burrowing and uh, it was a pretty short battle. They overwhelmed humanity. And that's where we join the story now is humans are starting to get together and they want to come back to Earth uh, from their orbital uh, space platform and find out, you know, who are these enemies? What do they do? Are there other survivors out there? And as we sort of move through the game, because it's going to be a, a live product, 
um, as we sort of grow it, uh, we're going to be adding to that story and revealing more about the dinosaurs, how they came to be, because uh, it's a pretty unreal concept, obviously. I'm I'm very into it. It's it's an unreal concept, but it's one that I, I think most people can get on board with. Uh, we've got some of the sort of these look kind of like velociraptors. We had some of them that were hurling uh, some sort of acid. There were ones with what looked like kind of invisibility camouflage. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the sort of different enemy variety we're going to see? For sure. I mean, uh, we have this idea of sort of base types of enemies and uh, they're different species. And then there's sort of mutations that come upon that. So our base raptor here, um, we wanted him to be recognizably a raptor. But as you get close to them, you sort of see there's something off about them. You know, the eyes aren't quite right. There's too many teeth. So that, that's the kind of like your, your basic mutant. And they're a kind of horde type enemy. Uh, but then there's other sort of spin-offs of the raptors uh, you mentioned, yeah, like the electric raptor, which uh, I guess we, it, we we took a very loose science approach. Uh, they're not fantasy, they're not magical. Um, so we were looking at kind of crazy things in the animal kingdom. Um, and like, yeah, okay, there's kind of animals that can do camouflage, there's animals that can deliver electric shocks. And we use those as jumping off points uh, to make our mutants. And then we do have bigger dinosaurs as well, kind of acting as our like specials. Uh, and um, yeah, we've got a T-Rex. I mean, we have to have a T-Rex in this kind of game, but obviously bigger and badder than your traditional T-Rex that you would see on screen. Now you're taking some liberties with the sort of the, the, the science side of things, which is completely okay because video games are supposed to be fun. Uh, is there any chance we're gonna see, you know, traditionally more, uh, you know, more gentle uh, herbivore dinosaurs reimagined as uh, as killing machines that we get to take on? Or is it just going to be carnivores that we're uh, pumping full of lead? No, uh, it's all types of dinosaurs. Uh, and we're going to be building up that roster of enemies as time goes on. Once we launch the game, uh, we've got some really cool plans. Uh, obviously, dinosaurs are a starting point. They're pretty awesome as it is. And then you're mutating them. Uh, and you can go pretty wild. And we have had to sort of rein ourselves back in and go, well, you know, for later, we can go that. That's going too far straight away. <laughs> uh, there's a lot we can do with it. And I have to say, these are evil mutant dinosaurs, right? You say even the herbivores are mean. I mean, that was a challenge. Like, how do you make them not cute? How do you make them look really nasty? And uh, yeah, the art team have done, and the animation team, I should say, have done an incredible job of going, taking something that you know, we all know and love and think, oh, they're so cute, to make you think, no, that's not cute. That's really not nice. I don't want to come against that. Yeah, so herbivores and uh, carnivores, they're all dangerous in the second extinction. I love it. I would love to continue talking about the dinosaurs, but we should probably also address the humans. Um, is this is this class based? Is everyone kind of kidding out their own character with you know different loadouts? Uh, can you speak a bit about about how that comes together? Sure. Um, so we've got uh, at the start of the game, we've got these four heroes, and they are an international cast, sort of from around the world. We wanted to get across that this was an international conflict. The whole world has gone down. Uh, so we have these different characters. Um, now they sit within different classes, uh, but each character has their own unique abilities as well. So there's sort of class aspects of certain weapons that they can use, class abilities, but then each character you know, will bring its own um, special ability to the fight. And uh, those classes you know, are, are pretty standard fare in the regard of there's a support class, there's a kind of generalist weapons class, and then there's a heavy uh, type of class as well. Um, but where the real fun is, is obviously yeah, the abilities. That's where we get to layer on something very special into the characters uh, and also tell a bit more about their character because uh, there's not a lot of storytelling as in traditional sense, cutscenes, that kind of thing. So we wanted to get across what these people are like in the abilities that they do uh, and the kind of VO lines that they trigger as well. Um, now, you do get to load out the characters as well. So it's not all preset. So you get to choose the weapons, uh, the... Um, the, the kit that you take in, which is, includes grenades, uh, but also payloads. Because you're up in space, a lot of stuff actually comes down. You'll see that in the video here. Things been shot up into space and things been sent back down again. And the payloads can be anything from a resupply uh, to a massive airstrike. Uh, so you as your team, you want to choose what's the stuff that we bring in to the game uh, to have a nice spread so you can sort of work together, uh, cooperate to deal with the dinosaur threat. And, now, can we speak uh, a little bit about the... Uh... Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. You were, you were telling us. Uh, I was just going to say there's an element of upgrading the weapons in the game as well. So each each weapon uh, 
has its own upgrade tree, and that's something you can sort of unlock as you go on and you research. And then those upgrades allow you to either specialize your weapon or make it more general. Um, we've aimed at making, rather than adding power constantly, we're trying to go for breadth. Uh, but it, it, it's anything from sort of more exotic things like fire ammunition uh, to a buff to reloading. And we let players sort of reconfigure the weapon. Once they've unlocked the things, they can change and adapt the weapons and try different things out for different types of missions. Right on. Can you speak a little bit about sort of the mission structure? We saw this open up with kind of a, you know, a, a dropship type of thing, and then everyone's sort of, you know, running around, looks like gathering a lot of resources. Um, can you talk a bit about sort of the different objectives we'll have in the game? For sure. So uh, the host of the game, uh, they uh, pick where they're going to come in on the map. Uh, so the map has these different regions, and there's actually a dynamic element of that uh, that we're going to talk about in uh, the future. But they have these kind of insertion points that sometimes are active, sometimes they aren't, and they can see where the mission is. So they choose where are we going to enter the mission. They might want to do some optional activities on the way, or they might want to get straight into the heart of the mission, get cracking, try and get through it quickly uh, so they don't run out of supplies. Uh, once they've chosen that, you get the uh, quite cool insertion sequence, down you go. And then uh, depending on the area you've landed in, it might be an area that has supplies. Great, you can top up what you've got, or it actually might be straight into the combat and you've got dinosaurs coming at you immediately, uh, which can be quite overwhelming, obviously. You then uh, have your mission, uh, often objectives that you can take out in uh, different orders, um, the order that you ch choose to do it in. And there is these optional activities that spawn around the map as well. So players can pick to do those um, if they want to. Now, once they've finished what's been asked of them uh, for the mission, then they have to extract. And here is uh, a sort of a one-off situation that happens every mission you play, you have to get back out. So you go to one of these extraction points, you call in the dropship, and depending on uh, how bad the area is, uh, the sort of the threat level of that area. Uh, it depends on how long the dropship's going to take to get to you, and you have to fight off the enemies for as long as possible until the dropship arrives. You can get on board and get back with all your loot and surviving. Nice. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the scale of the map? Because this is, I mean, it's it, it, it looks huge. Is it the kind of thing where that mountain over there, we could actually go all the way over there? Yes, so obviously the Heritage, uh, Avalon Studios um, um, uh, is all about these open world games. And we're not actually talking about this as an open world game. Uh, we're talking about this as a, a big map game. Um, because we have um, units, you know, on their feet, moving around. There's no vehicles in the game uh, apart from the dropship. And we found that actually the best sort of play experience was for a more compressed map i mean it's still pretty big uh and you can go anywhere you like as you would expect from this kind of game but it's not the the, the enormousness of other open world games out there so yeah we like to call it a big map game instead i like that that's that's fair um can you speak a little bit about how, when people will get their hands on it do you have a release window planned uh any plans for a, a beta or anything like that for sure, yeah. Um, well, we're not announcing uh, the release just yet, uh, but it's going to be announced very soon. There is going to be a beta. Um, you can actually sign up to that now on the website, uh, which is secondextinctiongame.com, and there's a war support, uh, slash war support. You can go there. And uh, there's a cool little referral scheme, so if you get your friends to sign up, you can get some exclusive kits uh, for your characters, uh, exclusive skins, that kind of thing. And yeah, we, we really want to start engaging with the community now, get a lot of people into the beta, get their feedback and and sort of grow, grow it together with them as time goes on. Nice. Well, shooting mutant dinosaurs in the face is fun, but it's even more fun with friends. Thank you for talking to me about the dinosaurs. I'm looking forward to hearing more about Second Extinction later this year.
That sounds like you're like my dog or something. You're not my dog. You're my coworker. Anyways, we're right in the middle of IGN Expo number one, part of IGN Summer of Gaming, a cavalcade of video game reveals and deep dives continuing tomorrow and indeed for weeks to come. Coming up after the break, Tom Marks will show us a new game he's been interested in. Then I'll be back to bring you a closer look at Metal Hellsinger, which, as you could probably tell from the badass trailer we just watched, is a rhythm-based shooting game in which you tear ass through hell. That sounds so painful. But it's a really cool game, so stay tuned. And check back tomorrow wherever you stream or on IGN1 on your Samsung TV Plus for more IGN Expos and the big Sony State of Play reveal stream. All that and much more right after this. Stay tuned. IGN Summer of Gaming is brought to you by Fuser, who will be partying with us all summer long. The biggest gaming event of the year is IGN's Summer of Gaming, and it's almost here. Tune into IGN throughout June to see the latest and greatest in game reveals, news, trailers, next-gen coverage, and more. We'll be kicking it off with our first ever IGN Expo, where you'll get first looks at world premiere game trailers, exclusive game demos, and interviews you won't find anywhere else. IGN's Summer of Gaming, only on IGN and IGN One on your Samsung TV+. Plus. Tired of watching IGN on those tiny cell phones and tablets? Well, IGN is moving to your living rooms. Starting in June, tune into IGN One on your Samsung TV Plus to see all that IGN has to offer, beginning with our exclusive Summer of Gaming event. You'll get first looks at world premiere game trailers, exclusive game demos, and next-gen console coverage that you won't find on any other network, only on IGN One. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and IGN is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. News, Games, and More is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent, going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us on Mixer.com slash IGN, YouTube.com slash IGN, and Twitch.tv slash IGN. See you there. Welcome to check out this game on IGN's Summer of Gaming, where we highlight exciting, under-the-radar games worth your attention. This first one asks the wonderfully ridiculous question of what would happen if you took GTA 2's top-down action mayhem and set it during medieval times. Take a look at some exclusive new gameplay from Rustler Grand Theft Horse.
Like what you see? Then head on over to IGN.com or YouTube.com slash IGN to watch the full extended version of this gameplay. I'm Sydney Goodman, and I'm so excited for you to be joining us. A little while ago, we premiered the trailer for Metal Hellslinger, and oh my gosh, was it amazing. And here to talk more about this exclusive reveal is none other than David Goldfarb. So, David, let's dive Hello. in. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for being here with us all the way from Sweden. So, yeah, we just saw your trailer. So Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just saw your trailer for the very first time. Let's just dive in because that looks like something I have never seen before. So it is a rhythm shooter. Can you tell us about that? Um, should I tell you about the origin of it or should I tell you about the... Uh, I mean, like the idea is that um, I think when uh, I was thinking about it originally, it was something... Uh, the, there's sort of this zen state that you get into when you're playing rhythm games um, mm -hmm. and I get, you get into them also with first person shooters and then at some point I was thinking it would be cool if I could do both um, and then especially if if, um, if it had music that I loved involved I felt like those three things would work and therefore we wound up improbably making this crazy thing uh, yeah so, that, yeah. so that's uh, <laughs> So it's a labor of love. It brings the two things that you love together into one. That is true. Yeah. Um, oh, you're doing a lot of, I'm just looking at the camera. Um, so let's start with what exactly are we watching right now? Like, is it a rhythm? Sh I feel like a lot of rhythm games, you choose the song that you want to play and then you play it, right? It's very like stagnant. Can we expect that there's going to be a through line? Is there a story? Yeah. So. It's unlike, um, I think there, there are games that typically do this and they are static, as you point out, you have like a static track that you're trying to play against. Um, and we tried that and it wasn't fun. And we're like a shooter, we've made a lot of shooters internally, um, uh, you know, at the people at the studio. Um, and so knowing that we wound up making a shooter um, that has these rhythm components uh, rather than thing where you're on rails and you're trying to do things to you know to um that essentially like limit your agency as a, as a player so for us um it was more important to make it feel like organic and dynamic than it was um to have you follow like static song and that the music is also a huge part of this so the, the music here is is dependent on um on your your performance so like right now you're at 16x uh, you can see right there so like the vocals Mm -hmm. um, are actually playing. If you drop down, like layers of the uh, of the music begin to drop out. So, like for me or for a lot of people, like who want to hear the music all the time, you want to both for scoring purposes and for just like you know hear the music that you really dig. Um, you want to keep it at six. You want to keep the multiplier as high as possible to, to to get all that stuff. Wow, wait, that's such an interesting component because I feel like I completely agree. You almost are motivated not just to kill the enemies, but also because you want to hear the full track sort of a thing. So let's talk about the scoring yeah. a little bit. Um, how does the scoring work exactly? Um, well, I mean, right now, this is like a super early build. So actually, we had to disable like, a whole bunch of scoring stuff. So, um, but like in, in principle, um, like there's a, there's a whole bunch of criteria that we're evaluating, like you keeping the beat, like you see right there, using paths to kind of uh, keep, keep, the, keep the beat up. So everything that you do, every action that you take, um, that uh, like shooting the enemy or hit it, you see, see yourself hitting him on the, on the beat there, um, killing him on the beat or uh, any number of other actions, um, all those things uh, give, give you score, and the score is multiplied by the, the, the thing that you see up there, that's a sort of multiplier, mm -hmm. and there are any number of things that kind of give you score in the course of the game. Um, so, and then at the end, of the end of the level, there are a number of other criteria that are applied, and those things collectively give you, like, you know, your, your actual score. 
Gotcha. So are you progressing through the level once you hit a certain number? So like you, we just saw 900,000. So once you pass 900,000, let's just say, does a higher level enemy appear or are you just trying to get the highest score possible as you go throughout the level? You're trying to get the highest score for the leaderboards and also to earn souls, which uh, is I probably won't talk about right now. But um, the and Fair. those things are um, a point, like a point of progression and and um, uh, persistence things give you access to other, whether it's upgrades or mm -hmm. other things uh, later in the campaign. And there, so there is. But the thing you asked originally is there a is there like a story? The answer is yes. Um, so we can. Can talk about that, or I can avoid it. Yeah, no, I would love to dive into the story if you're willing to tell us about it. I mean, it takes place in hell, as we saw in the trailer. I can talk a little about it because I think we, the marketing will kill me if I if I reveal too much. <laughs> um, but uh, what I can say is that um, you know you're playing this character, the unknown, and uh, she is the sort of um, or she's the one who is there to in theory, overturn the the order of the hells um, and replace the order with, with chaos. At least that's that's the sort of broad setup. And, and there's this ruler that's sort of uh, the Red Judge, who's, uh, I don't know if we've seen them, maybe we will later. Um, and they're the antagonist, they're the uh, immovable uh, object to your irresistible force. And so that's kind of like the, the two of you are sort of opposed to one another. and. Um, are eventually going to come into mortal conflict, uh, and so mm -hmm. yeah, so that's that's the, that's the setup, and you travel through all these different hells, and um, things will happen, and there's there is hopefully something like a, a story that's super metal that people will enjoy um, <laughs> al along the way. Okay, so I we're like slowly running out of time, and I feel like I have so many questions because this game is so intriguing to me. So let me start with you stopped yourself from saying antagonist, and I know that a lot of your games in the past or in a lot of interviews, you've talked about kind of this idea of perspective and mm. offering a player the perspective of what might traditionally be the bad guy. Does this game kind of explore that philosophy? Uh, yep. I mean, in as much as it can in this context, I, I think um, n none of the things that I like, I think, are not present. So um, just in the way that you're playing the, this character who looks a certain way and seems to be doing a certain thing, and the, the enemy that you're fighting looks a certain way and seems to be doing a certain thing. Um, I, I'm And the paths, the skulls, same thing. All those things, I think, I... I I would hope that the, my particular things that I care about are also present um, there. So yeah, yeah, that's that's the, awesome. Most okay. evasive answer. Most evasive <laughs> answer I could possibly give. So I just this question is solely for me, um, but we mm -hmm. have to end the interview really quickly. So I'm going to ask it super fast. But is the person that we're watching in that um, in the footage that we just watched are they just really good at the game, or does the music tailor to? your shooting abilities so that you're on beat they are really good got they it are okay cool. good. that's definitely vibing um, yeah that person is super good like if you play probably not going to be that good and not at the, not at the start okay. uh, in <laughs> fact i remember t i told the person who was doing it like jesus all right well you're really good so yeah there's a calm down there's definitely yeah it's it's cool though Alrighty. Well, David, thank you so much for talking to us. Before we go, do you have any information that you can give us on when we can expect to play this game and maybe what platforms it's coming to? Um, I think we can. We can say that it's coming to uh, PC and uh, next gen and to um, current gen and it's coming in 2021. Thank you so much. We definitely look forward to hearing more about Metal Hellslinger in the future. Oh, hey, you. Well, now we head from a bullet hell to a concrete jungle. If you're a fan of the Yakuza series, Yakuza Like a Dragon is probably already on your radar, and you know what you're in for, which is a densely packed city map full of minigames, organized crime, and ridiculous brawls. In case you're unfamiliar, here's 15 minutes of exclusive first look gameplay with one of the producers telling us all about the new game. Quick question, though. Will someone get beaten over the head with a bicycle?
No, I'm kidding. I already know the answer. Of course they will. Let's see what else Max found out about Yakuza Like a Dragon. As the eighth entry in the Yakuza series, Yakuza Like a Dragon might seem a bit intimidating, but launching on a whole bunch of different platforms and with a new protagonist and a brand new setting, it's as good a jumping on point as any. Joining me to talk about this brand new game is Scott Strickart, the senior localization producer from Sega on this wonderful series. Scott, thank you for joining us. Always good to hang out with you, Max. So, uh, I have been on somewhat, somewhat on media blackout with Like a Dragon. This is obviously a huge, big new installment uh, that is doing a lot of new stuff with the series. Uh, it's already been out in Japan for a little while, but uh, you guys always go a really long way with you know, how you approach localization. Um, for people who haven't been paying close attention, can you give us a little bit of a rundown of you know, what the setting is, who the main character is, and uh, what we can expect to see? Right, so uh, our previous protagonist, Kazuma Kiryu, his story arc ended in Yakuza 6, and we are picking up the uh, new character, Ichiban Kasuka here, um, with a brand new storyline all featuring him. Uh, he's our new protagonist, and he's very much a different guy than Kiryu ever was. There's, there's a lot of different things about him that are, uh, that, you know, where's, where Kiryu is, we all kind of know him. Ichiban's going to um, hopefully steal everyone's hearts as, uh, as we get uh, into his story. So... His, his primary story is, takes place in uh, Yokohama, which is a, a city kind of adjacent to, um, well, it's in Tokyo, but it's, you know, a different suburb. So um, it's a completely new city for us. It's like three times the size of Kamurocho, and it's uh, going to be pretty cool. Now, one of the big, huge changes that's happening this time around is that uh, Yakuza, which is, you know, historically a kind of an action beat-em-up, uh, is now a party-based, uh, turn-based RPG. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you're maintaining the same level of expectation for totally over the top action in a, you know, a more of an RPG setting. Absolutely. So Ichiban is, uh, his story is um, heavily dependent on his friendships that he makes with these uh, other, other characters. They're all kind of coming from the same kind of uh, climbing out from rock bottom kind of situations. It's a, it's a lot of people kind of uh, from the edges of society coming together. And the dev team really felt like the best way to portray that was to allow the character part, the player to, um play as play as more than more than just ichiban to really kind of hang uh hang their hat on that like friendship thing that's kind of happening with ichiban so he's he's a very charismatic dude and he attracts people to his to his kind of demeanor but at the and at the same time um he's a retro gamer so um these these uh kind of rpg battles that are happening are very much kind of his his mind his mindset kind of happening in, in uh that you're looking at when you, whenever the battles kind of transition you probably saw that like that when the when the battle transitions, the the enemies that are that are, he's fighting literally become like this this almost kind of like monsters, and that's all kind of happening in his head, being portrayed kind of in the game. But we haven't we absolutely haven't forgotten um, our roots as an action game, and there's all kinds of ways that we're um, playing playing heavily to the to the audience who expects kind of more more quicky quick snap pit snappy kind of action. Um, so that's all kind of incorporated into this RPG turn based system that. Um, kind of under the under the hood will allow you to still kind of perform these the action that you will love and know from the Oxa series. I dig that. Uh, so your your party and your friends that you're making, can you talk a bit about how like how much variety you're going to have in terms of um, you know party members and characters you're going to be meeting along the way? Right. So right now we have the uh, full party of four. Um, you can get up to uh, six plus one. Uh, party member optional um and that's so that's that's going to be one way that you can differentiate your party but we also have a full-on job system with 19 jobs that you can take up and you know a lot of the times i think when you think of a job system you're like all right you know here's my thief my ranger my 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 mage kind of things but we're using a, you know classic yakuza approach for this and allowing you to select like real life jobs so um you know we'll, we'll show some some of that gameplay in a, in a in a bit here but um We'll 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 change all the jobs for the characters. You'll see some of, some of that kind of come into play. Now, in the previous Yakuza games, you occasionally you know get different outfits, but they're usually not something you can you can unlock in, until uh, you know later in the game. Are we going to see? Uh, I, I don't know if armor is the right word, but sort of different different wardrobe for Ichiban and your party members. <laughs> yes, yes. So each job has its own custom uh, outfit, and then in addition to its own custom outfit has. Uh, a couple different variations on it. So 
not only that, um, there's going to be all kinds of unlockable kind of costumes that like we always do, that we throw those into the uh, free free add-on stuff that like like Yakuza does. We're, the, we're one of the only people who continues to just throw free content post-launch and those all will have costumes in it. Now, the setting, I want to talk about this. How would you say it compares other than just in terms of scale to some of the previous settings uh, like uh, Sotenbori or Kamurocho? So Yokohama is is a massive uh, port city and it's got like a... Uh, nine different districts. So you've got the uptown, you've got low town, you've got downtown, you've got the commercial district, you've got an industrial district, you've got uh, Korean town and Chinatown and all these different like areas kind of have their own vibe and their own feel to them. And what's neat about it is that, you know, there's a, you may have noticed as, as he was playing some of the, the gameplay that like there's a different threat level to each of those. So like wandering too far and outside of your level is definitely going to be more of a challenge for you. And you're going to have to um, really kind of pick your strategy better when you're when you're roaming through more dangerous areas. In terms of enemy variety, we've seen like the wonderful, you know, the the there's the threatening men and there's delinquents and there's, you know, <laughs> various grades of street thugs. How do you maintain that same level uh sort of with, within the the pageantry of a, of an RPG? Uh are there going to be so, are we going to get fantastical here? Is it going to get really like over the top? You probably saw that um <laughs> As like I, like I was mentioning, like the, the enemies are literally transform, um, and that's something that we play into really heavily. Um, there's 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 all kinds of different types of monsters. Um, you add them uh, very early on in the story. You you gain what's called a suji dex um, in, your, in your as an app on your phone. And if that sounds familiar, that's there's a reason it does. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so you're basically running around collecting these monsters into your into your phone app, and um, they're all they're all very very kind of homage type of enemies to RPGs while at the same time mixing them with that Yakuza like um, real life level. So like that guy that changed into a Berserker, for instance, you know, that we used a lot of Western names that are um, <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're very much an homage to a very particular uh, series that um, Ichiban is a fan of called Dragon Quest. I love that. So this is, this feels like a, a Yakuza game where you're you're playing as a JRPG nerd within the game. Like there's that level of like, it seems very meta. It's a little meta. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a whole conversation that um, Ichiban has with his party members early on. And he's like, guys, did you see the, did you see those monsters transform? And they're like, no bro, but whatever it is that you're <laughs> thinking, like that's fine. As long as it helps you fight. <laughs> I guess we've seen, I think I, I caught a glimpse of, of Kiryu showing up in, uh, one of the one of the trailers or some some gameplay. Can you talk about sort of how this is going to intersect with the existing you know Yakuza uh, Judgment universe? So it's it is definitely set in the same universe. Um, when Ichiban gets out of uh, Ichiban takes uh, takes the fall for a crime that he didn't commit, very similar to our previous protagonist. But when he gets out uh, in the year twenty nineteen, um, it's uh, a brand new world for him in which the Omi Alliance has essentially taken over Kamurocho. And if you're familiar with the kind of rivalry that the Omi and the Tojo clan have had uh, for the last six plus games. Um, you know, that's a huge deal, right? Like it's, it's massive. And so um, all of that is kind of unfolding in the background as Ichiban is uh, continually like kicked lower and lower. And all, like you mentioned, you know, Kiryu and some of our, our previous uh, pro tags even are um, kind of, kind of in the background and you'll definitely intersect with them kind of later in the game in a way that is epic, but I don't want to spoil too much. Now, I think my favorite part of the Yakuza series, obviously the the super heavy duty, dramatic, you know, you know, operatic crime stuff is cool, but I love all of the weird sub stories and just, you know, side characters you run into along the way. Uh, and you and the localization team always seem to have a really good time uh, bringing that stuff to the beginning of this, of this footage, who it seemed like you could talk to. Can you talk about some of just the, the silly stuff that we're going to be doing in this game, in addition to oh the heavy God. duty crime drama. So yeah, you, you saw that the the crawfish over there, her name's Nancy. Um, I don't want to talk too much about <laughs> Nancy because we will absolutely be showing more of Nancy later. But uh, yes, that, that involves Ichiban basically making friends with the crawfish. And uh, you know, it's as just as bonkers as you might expect Yakuza to be. There's still heartwarming uh, sub stories. There's still very like, you know, dramatic sub stories, but for the most part, the sub stories pre lean pretty hard into the, the nonsense side of things. Uh, not to mention all the jobs and special attacks that uh, you're, we're now kind of seeing that, uh, you know, the, the musician, for instance, having a, a move called Album Drop, where he literally drops an album on a guy. So, <laughs> uh, Now, the other thing that is huge in Yakuza games is all the different sort of mini games and activities. We've seen some of these teas. This has cart racing. Is that right? 
Dragon Cart is a full on like a Tokyo, you know, it's very popular in Japan where you like get in those like little go karts and run around the town. But of course, we had to bring our, our Yakuza twist to that with uh, rocket launchers and satellites and all that kind of nonsense and machine guns. So that's that's very much a mini game you can play. Um, I think later in this footage, we're going to show a little bit of can quest. You can hop on like a rickshaw and start collecting cans, um, but for a little bit of side income. And uh, the, that's that's hilarious. And here we are. Uh, your, your goal here in this mini game is to uh, collect these cans and get the boosts and without getting kind of taken out by your competition, competition who's out there also uh, collecting cans. You have to ram them and you have to avoid the garbage truck and the thieves and get back to the goal in time before uh, running out of time to collect your cans. <laughs> Are we going to see any of the sort of the business management type of uh, games we've gotten used to? I mean, we've done we've we've run we've run hostess clubs. We've done, uh, you know, real estate and, and construction companies. There is a full-on uh, business management mode um, sub-story happening, and it's just as intricate as Real Estate Royale was, where Ichiban will be tasked with taking over a failing confectionery company um, and taking that from a literally literally failing company to a, uh, a, a great holdings company where um, you'll have to uh, recruit managers, assign them to properties, and uh, to go into these really epic like shareholder battles where the shareholders are lay laying out their grievances and you have to fight them and apologize to them with naturally over the top level of yaks and nonsense. <laughs> that's that's exactly what I wanted to hear. I mean, the, the thing about this series <laughs> that I love is that you wind up latching on to the thing that was you least expected. You know, there'll be some little mini game that you're like, that sounds weird. Who would be into that? And then, you know, you find yourself sinking 11 hours into it and you're like, oops. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can you, uh, are there going to be, is there going to be any dating? Uh, we've seen that kind of, that kind of got dabbled in in, uh, in uh, uh, Judgment. Yeah, um, if you're familiar with the, um, I guess, I guess the Persona series where you can level your kind of uh, personality up a bit. Uh, if you raise certain levels of your personality enough, you might be able to approach uh, some of the ladies you've met throughout the, the previous, the, the storylines and all that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, it's definitely there. Uh, you just have to, learn, you have to earn it. Now you mentioned Persona. That's another another Sega property. Obviously, that's kind of the the people when people think like the turn-based JRPG that. Sega makes that's the, that's the big one, and now Yakuza is kind of dipping their toe into that. Have the have the teams like interacted at all, given each other notes on that kind of thing? Or that's a great question. Um, they're in the same building. I couldn't tell you, but um, it's. I think there's there's definitely some some learnings happening, and I think it's it's just a cool kind of marriage of of ideas that's, that's certainly you're seeing uh, with not only Persona but also like a dragon. I love it. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's interesting to see this these sort of parallels. They're you know they're both both games where you go exploring uh you know in japan and, and making friends and, and fighting stuff and in this case it seems like it's <laughs> it's definitely dabbling in that jrpg territory but it's still squarely uh you know yakuza stuff uh can you talk about sort of the the i guess it doesn't it like it's weird because it doesn't look turn-based i guess the sort of the spacing seems really dynamic and and almost more uh action rpg-ish Definitely, it's super snappy. Um, so, like, you not only in the, uh, during battle are you can you can you can for one automate as anyone that you'd want um, to automate. So you can make it incredibly snappy that way. But also, there's this very dynamic kind of live action kind of feel happening where the characters are just kind of you know they're, they're dancing around each other a little bit. And so, like, if a character is um, between you and a, and a or if, if a bike is between you and a character, your character will automatically like, pick up that bike, weave it into his attack. Um, and so like, you know, that, that happens. And then another character, if you've leveled up your bond via drink links with that character, um, they will, um, you know, step in and do an, an, a, a follow-up attack. And, uh, you know, there's action prompts that are like, you know, where um, you've probably seen them throughout the footage where the, uh, the character, you'll have to be pressing buttons and, and um, you can do perfect guards. And so you're, you are like on your toes at the whole, the whole time. It's not a very passive battle system at all. Um, you can, uh, tailor that to, to be as slow or as fast as you want. Well, that is awesome. Um, this was, of course, got a big, huge announcement reveal thing at the, there was the Xbox Series X uh, presentation, direct state of Xbox, whatever the hell we're calling it. There's too many of these things. Uh, <laughs> right. we, and everyone's dying to know about next gen. Can you say anything about what people can expect from Yakuza Like a Dragon on the Series X compared to sort of current gen? Uh, we're definitely supporting the smart delivery feature. Um, and out, outside of that, there's like, we're still figuring that out a little bit, but um, for the most part, we're we're ready to support next gen on this, which is gonna be pretty cool. Okay, so when can people expect to get their hands on Yakuza Like a Dragon, Scott? We'll be there day one on Xbox Series X, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Windows 10, and Steam. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming by and chatting. I'm a big fan of Yakuza, as you might have guessed by my suit. I get married in the suit, and I do my Yakuza E3 interviews in this suit. Anyway, thanks for coming by. This has been great. Uh, I'm dying to know more about Yakuza Like a Dragon, and uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, Max. Thank you. Now that we're up to speed on Like a Dragon, it's time for another quick break, but don't worry, it won't drag on. <laughs> Stick around for another round of exclusive new game trailers, the latest on Borderlands 3 DLC, and more as IGN Expo Day 1 continues. Then check back tomorrow for another charity speed run, IGN Expo number 2, and Sony State of Play reveal stream, Summer is just getting started. IGN Summer of Gaming is brought to you by Fuser will be partying with us all summer long. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and iGen is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. Everybody loves watching a speed run of their favorite game. But what if you got the opportunity to peek into the minds of the developers while they watch their games getting completely wrecked? That's exactly what happens in every episode of Game Devs React to speedruns. You can do that. Oh my god! <laughs> we invite you to ride along with the developers as they react to, question, and enjoy some of the most skilled players exploiting and speeding through a game it took years of their life to create. Join us every Saturday for a new episode. Hey there, do you have opinions on games, movies, TV, or other weird stuff on the internet? You can take part in our new show, Power Ranking, where you can vote on all your favorite things on the internet. Go do it now, it. do it, just go. Do vote. it. Go vote. News, Games, and More is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent, going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. See you there. This is IGN Summer of Gaming, and we are still in the midst of IGN Expo 1. Don't forget, all Summer of Gaming long, IGN is asking you to give to the Bail Project Fund and World Health Organization by clicking the donation links in the description of this video or heading on over to donate.ign.com. The Bail Project is a nonprofit that pays bail for people in need, reuniting families, and restoring the presumption of innocence. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization's COVID-19 Response Fund is dedicated to studying, tracking, and combating the coronavirus pandemic. All of this is all very well and good, but even better, by donating, you'll have a chance to win codes for games like Resident Evil 3 and swag from companies like Bethesda. And for even more Summer of Gaming goodness, download the TikTok app, follow IGN, and check out the Summer of Gaming hashtag where you can watch along with live events from Summer of Gaming, submit your own Summer of Gaming moments, Summer of Gaming reactions, and Summer of Gaming plays. I just said Summer of Gaming so many times. Summer of Gaming. But we're only just now getting started and we've got a lot to cover. So let's check out some more new trailers for incredible upcoming games. Rapid fire style. Judges. Show me the trailers. I have no idea what that's from. If you know, let us know in the chat. Welcome to the Western Pacific. I'm Dr. Mirai Soto, and I'll be your eyes and ears on this expedition. 
I'm joined today by two colleagues. Hello, I'm Andre. And I'm Irina. First time on a live stream. Be gentle with her. Oh, wow. Glad we didn't miss this. Beautiful. Why are you so focused on this part and the baby? I'm hoping to follow the baby for years, to learn from her as she learns from her family. Hello, Mariah. Thanks for checking in. Feeling settled in the sun? Has everything tested out? Fabulous. The overhead speakers sound great. Glad I brought my tunes. Science is not magic, it takes patience. I'd like to believe in a little magic. Irina, did you expect volcanic activity here? Andre, who is messing with my whales? is life or death and sometimes the people with the biggest smiles have the coldest hearts the marshals are sworn to uphold order in Colorado Springs but they're more like the patriarch's private army the only orders they uphold are his the Gippers claim their God president will make America the shining city on the hill it once was. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to a thousand years of darkness. But they kill anyone they think is a communist, and they think everyone is a communist. Then there's the hundred families. They claim they want a better Colorado. And they do. But mostly just for themselves. Every group has a plan for Colorado's future. Even those Butcher and Dorseys. But it's up to you, Ranger. Whose side are you on?
So the demon world separated into turfs. And these turfs, yeah, they're filled with all kinds of nasties, all right. Each gang's got their big, scary leader, too. Want a tussle? Oh, God! You dare! Initiate a challenge move. But none stand a chance at the <laughs> Demon King himself. I say it's time to kick his sorry butt out of here. My time to shine. If you liked those dual universe spaceships, you can actually download a file to 3D print one by visiting the dual universe site at duelthegame.com. And right now you can get a discount by using the promo code IGN20. In other news, with AAA games like Mario Odyssey, Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated, and Psychonauts 2 leading the charge, the 3D platforming renaissance seems to be upon us. And it doesn't look like it's stopping anytime soon. Brian got to chat with one of the designers of a game that could prove to be the next big indie platformer. Demon Turf. Let's check it out. In 2017, retro platformer Slime Song captured our hearts and kicked our asses. And now for Braz, the studio that gave us Slime Song is back with something brand new, Demon Turf. From Fabraz, please welcome CEO Fabian Rossifar and lead programmer Ben Miller. Uh, so we have entered the, the world of Demon Turf, which is a, a brand new platformer that you guys are working on. Uh, tell me about it. How did, how did this come together uh, and what is this game? Um, basically, it kind of was uh, something that was brewing in my head for a while. And um, I've always grown up with platformers, 2D platformers and 3D platformers. And we felt with Samsung, we really kind of did everything we wanted to do with the genre, but we weren't quite done with what comes with a platforming game. And so we started experimenting with a 2.5D game at first that then developed into Demon Turf, uh, our now 3D platformer, our big take on the 3D platforming genre um, that kind of tries to combine everything we love from it, but then also trying to bring new things to it that are different. Um, and we're just really, really excited to bring it to you. In a way, for us, this is kind of a spiritual successor to Slime Sun. So did this kind of break your brains to have to work on something that was 2D and sort of traditional and was specifically, you know, uh, evocative of an entire style of, of game, a whole era of video games, to now jump into 3D? That took many other game developers like 15, 20 years to get accustomed to. And for you guys, it was just like two or three years. You're already into the next dimension. So what, what were some of the sort of challenges of going from 2D to 3D from a strictly platforming sense? I mean, honestly, 
and I think Ben can back me up on this, the weirdest thing about this project is how smooth it's been. Um, every time we tried out something new, it just kind of worked out pretty well. Yeah, I'd say, especially on the mechanical side, a lot of the tricks we learned from SlimeSon, we kind of could extend and bring into 3D and it just felt like a natural extension. Where actually was where we did like find challenges was more on the art style side of like, there's actually a lot of things that 3D makes a lot simpler that then combining 2D and 3D like this, like this actually brings in whole new challenges of like spacing and, and trying to get you know, a tab on how enemies are facing and that kind of thing that then you, we basically had to come up with new solutions for that work for both these kind of approaches. And this is because we are yeah. combining 2D art with 3D environments. I think that's kind of the, the thing that is very different about it and came with complications, but I think works out really well for just how cool it looks, I think. Yeah, it sort of reminds mm -hmm. me of like when I first played uh, Super Mario 64 and I was surprised at the amount of 2D elements in that game, so like fences and some, some blades mm -hmm. of grass and stuff like that. Um, it's almost sort of like this kind of Paper Mario-ish aesthetic where you have this 2D character that's kind of fl flipping on different planes or like going through sort of simplistic animation, but it's still very animated. And so uh, tell me about traversal in this game, because this this character is doing an kind of incredible sort of array of different moves here, uh, more so than I would say, you know, there's been a, a, a sort of a renaissance of uh, kind of N64 inspired 3D platformers in the last few years. This character seems to have like a pretty insane move set. I saw like a hook shot and then transforming into a bat. We're now sort of like, uh, I, I don't know, like underwater jetting through this tunnel. Like mm -hmm. how, how did all this come together? It exploded. I mean, honestly, we kind of started working from, from the basics. You know, you've got a jump, then you've got a double jump. Then we're like, okay, let's add some more dynamic jumps. So we've got triple jumps, uh, triangle jumps, uh, super jumps, which are basically combinatorial ones that you can do with your other demon forms, which are the double jump demon form and the spin demon form, which allows you to traverse over a certain distance and then slowly fall. But then if you jump out of that, you create a super jump. And so that kind of just like it build up from each other. In a, in a really crazy way. And what we did for progression um, is that we decided some of these things we're gonna lock out and you unlock them throughout the game. And these are the, what we call the turf abilities. Basically each turf brings a new one. And so the hookshot is the first one. The second one is uh, the rolling demon, which you see right here actually, um, which is basically a snake biting its own tail, becoming a wheel, and then you just <laughs> go at it. Um, the third ability is a glide, which is essentially a, a crow demon that you can turn into. And then the fourth one is the craziest one that honestly, we spend a lot of time on because entire games can just focus on that one mechanic alone, a timeout bubble. Basically you can shoot out a, a spherical bubble that the longer you charge the bigger it is, that anything within that bubble, the time slows down. Enemies, moving platforms, bullets, you name it. Um, wow. So we've, it's just got more and more. And then the really big part that is also, also a, a uh, big focus of the game is the combat, um, which Ben is a, you know, like this is like love child. So I'm sure he wants to talk about it. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, like we were trying to find our own ways to sort of put our spin on, on the genre and for the combat, we want to try something different from like the typical health bar and game down to zero health approach. So we tried to go for something very like momentum driven and physics -y where uh, it's one hit kills for anything with like spikes or pushing enemies off ledges, but you just have this like different size of hands and punch combos you can send out that it's all about sort of pushing enemies around. It's like a tug of war of trying to get them into the right position to then knock them off the stage or into a hazard. And so then we, that was sort of a starting point that then branch off in all different kinds of directions for the combat and, and mechanic design of the game. Now, in terms of level design, is it sort of uh, freeform? Like, does it feel like it's a, a kind of situation where the player can kind of explore and traverse as, as they want and sort of accomplish goals? Or are there like set parameters for what they need to do in a specific level? It's a bit of a combination. So basically, um, you've got hubs, which you can freely explore. And there's NPCs, there's side quests, there's shops that you can spend collectibles on. And levels do have collectibles. But I wouldn't say that this game is necessarily a collectathon at its heart because the levels are a start to finish line scenario. Um, however, we have a couple of really cool twists there um, because basically your goal is to become the demon queen, right? So the, the, the demon king currently rules over all turfs and you first have to convince all the gangs of each turf to join your cause to then take on the, uh, the big honcho. And 
that means that when you go through a turf, which is basically a game world, and you go through all the levels, that's your first visit. But then once you've done them all and you've beaten the, tur the turf leader, you can revisit these levels and they're completely remixed at that point. We call it the, the, the return state. And basically at that point, the time of day might have changed, the weather has changed, the layout has changed, there's new challenges. Um, and that's kind of like our big twist that we throw in there where, where essentially it's, it's like New Game Plus, but you unlock it already right at the beginning. And it's far more than just a regular remix, but it's a, essentially a new level. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, then I'll... Um... <laughs> Uh, that on top of that, there's also, that's when we introduce the turf ability so that you start re-exploring these levels with this new mechanic that lets you engage mm -hmm. with sort of new parts you, you wouldn't have dealt, dealt with previously. And also it's um, kind of free form so that you have levels, but also you can do them whatever or you want so that you have to get through right. a set number to fight the boss, but then also you can do whichever order and sequence you want to. Mm -hmm. Now, uh... 3D platformers and 2D platformers in general have a sort of like long <laughs> history of mostly kind of like happy, optimistic protagonists. You know, like they're always like a big, like even like literally Mario is just constantly cheering and, and saying Yahoo, Wahoo and stuff like that. Um, your character looks like she doesn't really want to be hanging out with anybody. She's pretty much like, oh, she looks like, a, like me when I went on vacation with my family in high school where I was like, I don't want to be here. Uh, tell, yeah. me, tell me about the protagonist. <laughs> Yeah, so so her name's Beebs, um, and she's a very young demon. She's uh, a thousand years old, which is basically nothing in the <laughs> demon world. Um, not even reach her teens with that. Um, yeah. And she has a ton of attitude, and you definitely picked up on that. Um, the thing is about her, though, that she's kind of you know rough, uh, rough shell, but uh, soft uh, inside. She's kind of a softy um, because she does all of this. Her entire goal, basically is to just finally have people take her a little more serious. Um, because whenever she says that she wants to do something, they're like, oh yeah, sure you will when you grow up. Um, but she wants to prove that, hey, if I say I, I can take over these gangs, believe me, you know, and like, please don't let, let me be alone all the time because she's actually an, essentially an orphan. She has no parents of any kind. Um, and so that's kind of the narrative that, uh, that drives her. But uh, on the exterior, without a doubt, she's all about, you know, <laughs> Hmm. Attitude. <laughs> I like that because it's not just it's not just like toed. It's like specifically like there's it's it's, it's, it's definitely yeah. That's exactly <laughs> that's exactly yeah. it. Um, now, in terms of progression, uh, you talked about uh, gaining more power ups and stuff like that. We haven't really seen much in the way of boss fights so far. But is that something that uh, you guys are working on? Yeah, so because uh, the big narrative focus is that you have these turfs with their gangs and their turf leader, the leaders are the big bosses. And unlike what I really like is that unlike a lot of other games where, you know, you don't see the boss until you actually face them and then you just deal with them and you never see them again. These are real entities. These are characters that stick around. Um, so they, they hang around in their hub and you talk to them and they're like, yeah, I'm not... You can't fight me until you've convinced my gang that it's even worth it. And then you fight them and <laughs> afterwards they ad actually address you as the boss, begrudgingly, of course. Um, so it's kind of like a big part of also the, 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 the feel of the world. No, I love it. Um, now you listed some platforms at the end there. Uh, and any idea like around uh, like sort of a release date or anything at the, when we can play it? I want to play it. That's basically what I'm asking you. I just want to play this yeah. game immediately. <laughs> um, well, so we were still working on it. Um, so that footage is still technically alpha footage. Um, we don't have a solid release date yet. Uh, I can give you end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, Sweet. Platform, platforms, we definitely can confirm PC, so Steam and Epic Game Store. Uh, we can confirm Nintendo Switch, and we will most likely release on an Xbox platform. All right. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. We look forward to hearing more about Demon Turf in the future. <laughs>Well, Brian got to show off Demon Turf, but I have a commercial break because sometimes work assignments aren't fair, but we do need to pay the bills for a minute. But stick around for the scoop on a bunch more new games afterwards, plus tomorrow's Expo number two in Sony's much anticipated state of play, all about the PlayStation 5. So check back in wherever you stream or on IGN One on your Samsung TV Plus. We'll be right back. IGN Summer of Gaming is brought to you by Fuser, who'll be partying with us all summer long.
News, games, and more is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent, going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us on Mixer.com slash IGN, YouTube.com slash IGN, and Twitch.tv slash IGN. See you there. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and iGen is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. Welcome back to IGN Expo 1, a part of the Summer of Gaming. Don't forget, all Summer of Gaming long, IGN is asking you to give to the World Health Organization and Bail Project Charities. Be sure to click the donation links in the description of your video player or go to donate.ign.com for more information on how and where to donate. Let's get back into it. Observer is a cyberpunk horror game that was first released back in 2017, and now it's getting augmented, upgraded, and enhanced with a new coat of paint thanks to a next-gen release. The fine folks over at Bloober Team are about to give us a sneak peek at Observer System Redux, and you know what? I'm going to be nice and let you look at it too. Take a look. Go ahead. You can do it. Hi everyone, I'm Tomasz Bunkowski from the System Redux dev team. Today we'd like to show you an extensive gameplay demo, including the first glimpses of brand new story content. But first, let's take a look at how we use the next-gen power to deliver an even more immersive vision of year 2084. For Observer System Redux, we've rebuilt and upgraded the visuals in practically every aspect. The game uses now improved assets, including 4K textures, new high-quality animations and models, as well as upgraded particle effects and simulations. We've also significantly increased the overall lightning quality across the whole game, with the support of HDR and ray tracing, and thanks to such effects as volumetric lights or global illumination, System Redux delivers a much more atmospheric and impressive depiction of the dark cyberpunk future. Last but not least, we take advantage of the SSDs to massively shorten loading times, so that they are mostly unnoticeable for the player. Of course, Observer System Redux will run a 4K resolution at 60 frames per second. Now, let's see the game in action. Good. 
You who play as Dan, a detective of the future able to hack into the minds of others and search for clues and evidence. During questioning. Emergency extraction procedure successful. Right now, you're on the trail of the serial killer, but the victim just died before you could finish your neural interrogation. To find your next lead, you must search the room the old-fashioned way. Yes. Synchrony injected. Strain level decreased. Well, well. You must be Helen. What else are we hiding in here? Jesus. And what might that be? This altar of affection marks the beginning of one of the new storylines added to the system redux. Her fearful symmetry, as this side case is called, tells a psychotic love story explored through the lens of the game's dystopian and transhumanist themes. Right now, however, Dan must find Helena. Six five six two one zero. Oh. We have a third victim. Time of death, about an hour ago. Starting forensic analysis. Multiple puncture wounds, a few inches deep. Your detective work is enhanced with two scanners. Helena Novak, wife of the previous victim. I mean Novak. EM Visions lets you analyze electronic devices, while BioVision helps you pick up any organic traces and clues. The neural implants untouched. Warning. Attempting a necroneural connection is in direct violation of the Postmortem Observation Act of 2061. Authorization denied. Emergency override. Open maintenance panel. Let's fast forward a bit for the sake of this presentation. After the risky hacking of Helena's dead mind, Dan is closer to finding the killer, but starts to experience hallucinations. Disturbing visions, previously experienced only when hacking somebody's mind, begin to sip into the physical world, blurring the line between what's real and virtual, which is another of the important issues discussed in the story.
Dance has got a distress message from an unknown sender. If you follow this lead, it will start another of the new quests, Aaron Signal. These new cases are all designed to explore thought-provoking themes of a future that soon might become our present. But there are more than that. We're designing a full package along with new puzzles, game mechanics and mind-bending dream eater segments. With the code from the club, then can push forward after the killer. is here. This concludes today's presentation, but stay tuned for future reveals of all the upgrades and new content we're working on. Observer System Redux comes to PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X later this year. Thank you for watching. All right, well, to see the Observer trailer again in beautiful, stunning, magnanimous 4K resolution, head on over to IGN.com and you can have it as a treat. And for even more Summer of Gaming goodness, download the TikTok app, follow IGN, and check out the hashtag IGN Summer of Gaming, where you can watch along with live events and submit your own Summer of Gaming moments, reactions, and plays. While we're still on the subject of Observer, here's something that I've observed. Segways are very hard to write. That's right, I'm talking about Borderlands 3, everyone's favorite cel-shaded open-world looter shooter. Gearbox has done a great job supporting the game with a mess of story-driven DLCs, and they've got another one in the works. Our very own Mark Medina talked with the developer about Bounty of Blood. Let's see what he found out. Borderlands 3 came out back in September of 2019, and we're already on its third DLC pack, Bounty of Blood. I'm here with Matt Cox to tell us all about it. Hello, Matt. Hey, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. Yep. Let's, uh, let's just jump right in. Why is this the DLC to check out if somebody missed the first two? Uh, well, Bounty of Blood offers so much in the way of new gameplay objects and a new vehicle called the Jet Beast and of course a ton of, of new enemies to explore but uh, I'm very excited about uh, the story and the story is, uh, is a simple story of, of revenge and redemption set on a very brutal planet called Gehenna. But there's a lot to offer mm -hmm. from answering the sheriff's bounty to take on the Devil Riders, which are our main enemies uh, that have tamed the wild beasts that this company has experimented on. And so our mission is to take down uh, the Devil Riders using these new gameplay objects uh, and by any means necessary. So Bounty of Blood offers a level boost if you are just starting the game for the first time. Uh, how exactly is that going to work? Uh, it's it's pretty wonderful. So if you are not as far uh, into Borderlands 3, the campaign, to be able to access Sanctuary, the ship, uh, and be able to actually travel to different planets, we have a new feature that allows you to start a character right at that point in the story, so you don't have to worry about how much you've completed so far in the game, and you can jump into uh, uh, Bounty of Blood or any other story DLC. Oh, awesome. It's pretty cool. So it's like, it helps you get into any of them. Okay. So... 
we're in a Western now. We're in a Western setting. What's it like to be on this planet and travel around and meet these new characters? Yeah, Gehenna, is, again, it's a brutal frontier planet. It was once uh, this company's, uh, long gone company's testing ground for uh, new types of weapons and biological experiments. And, uh, and this whole planet is now overrun by these genetically modified uh, beasts and and their keepers uh, and these the devil rider gang has learned how to tame them so uh throughout uh the game you're going to see these devil riders like riding these experimental creatures but also uh while you're on the frontier the player has a brand new vehicle called the jet beast which is kind of like half yeah. jet bike half creature and with some some mounted weaponry that's pretty badass so you have these dual machine guns but uh if you uh are able to hijack some enemy jet beasts you can get a new weapon like a uh, a cannon shooter cannon shooter that's exactly what it's called cannon shooter uh like it's a cannon mount <laughs> uh and then there's also this what we call mortar. Them. yeah exactly because that is the technical uh ship name of uh of gun. <laughs> uh but there's also a, a mortar launcher you can find uh for the jet beast but uh the frontier is an amazing like it would probably remind you of uh, a typical Western frontier, but there's influences mm -hmm. from all over the world. But then we travel to some very, uh, very interesting uh, uh, locations, a, a lot of which I, I, you know, we're not going to spoil today. But there's there's a lot of mis sure. mysteries. And uh, Bounty of Blood actually is a self-contained story. Uh, the only... Mm -hmm characters that we're familiar with in this are the vault hunters themselves so every single character in this dlc is brand new how much does a dlc like this when you think about bounties how much does it offer to be able to sprinkle in like weekly or maybe even daily challenges where it's like hey we need you guys to gather a team and and you know here's the bounty and like go get this person i there's already a lot of that in borderlands 3 does this dlc just add to that well this is a more of a traditional campaign dlc where everything is already packaged into it as opposed to like mm -hmm. weekly events that our live team works really hard and does an amazing job with like with takedowns and all of those events this uh being a campaign dlc we do have uh, essentially other bounties for special, uh, you know, high ranking devil riders that you can. And the cool thing about the challenges uh, within uh, a bounty of blood is that they change the town in some way. So mm -hmm. you, uh, if you go do a creature challenge, you'll actually see, we have a tannery where you'll see that hide displayed as kind of your trophy. And uh, we also have a theater challenge. We have a theater in our town of Vestige. So we have the frontier planet, uh, the blast or part of the planet, which is called the Blast Plains. And then we have the town, which is called Vestige. And uh, the town uh, has been overrun uh, by the Devil Riders. And that's why the sheriff has, has uh, issued the bounty. But if you do certain challenges and things for the town, it changes the town in some way. So this theater challenge, you can find these lost film, film reels all across the DLC. And every time you uh, uh, find a lost film reel, you can go back into the theater in Vestige and see part of the film play out. And if you complete the entire challenge, you can watch a small film. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think everybody's going to want to know uh, loot. <laughs> so you bet. obviously Westerns, we got, you know, long rifles. We got, we got cool pistols, all this. Like, what can we expect from this like new Western themed DLC? Oh yeah. So we're, yeah, you're going to get a, a bunch of new loot, uh, some cool new legendary guns, uh, as you would expect from any sort mm -hmm. of DLC drop, uh, from Gearbox and Borderlands. Um, but yeah, we have, we do have pistols. You can't have a Western without pistols, but not all the, not all the new loot that you find will be, uh, uh, pistols. We have some, they're not, some they're not all sharpshooters. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We have uh, something called a bubble blaster that you may find if you do a certain side mission that has high damage soap bubbles. Uh, so we go sure. crazy and, and weird with some of the new things you find, but we also have a particular Torg weapon that features gyro jets that leaves sticky bombs on enemies as it passes through them. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Uh, I'm a big, <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of collecting skins, and so I would assume that this DLC is going to come with 
all sorts of fun cowboy themed skins, I would hope. You you can expect to have a very uh, a bounty of blood themed uh, skin pack for uh, the Vault Hunters for sure. Okay, so what is what is like the one thing that you're most excited for people to see without spoiling anything? What is like the one thing that you're like, man, I, I really can't wait for people to see this? Uh, that's man, that's like saying pick one of your five children and tell me why they're <laughs> the best. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, uh, well, we've we, we've talked about the town. That's cool. Uh, Rose and Juno are our allies. Then brand new characters mm -hmm. that anchor uh, our DLC. Juno is a rough and tumble brawler with a checkered past, and Rose is our guide and an ally. Um, so I'm excited about them. Uh, town changes are great. Jet Beast new vehicle also incredibly mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say I am. It's tied between our new gameplay objects that are a little bit of a mm. Metroidvania uh, uh, ingredient into what we're doing with Bounty of Blood, uh, as well Sounds as good. the narrator. We haven't talked about the narrator yet. So this is oh, right, new right. for Borderlands. We, we actually have a, a character that's vocal only. We'll never see him, but he comments mm -hmm. on the events, uh, whether it's story or context to objectives. So we actually have a narrator character that is uh, following us, uh, telling us about the story uh, as we're playing it. Um, so that's really cool. But I, I'm a gameplay person at heart, so uh, uh -huh. I'm a Nintendo head, honestly. I grew up playing a bunch of Mario and Zelda, and I still do with my kids. So uh, gameplay is where a lot of my heart lies. So we have a trader weed, a course floater, a breezer, and a telezapper. And we unlock these new gameplay objects as you play through the story. And so the trader weed, when you find it, uh, it turns enemies to your side. A course floater is a big rock type of plant made of core, and core is is the uh, the element that everybody's excited about on this planet, trying to mine for core. But course floater, you melee it, and it shotguns out high damage shrapnel. So, uh, and then a breezer is is kind of like a jump pad. It helps you soar into the air, and then our telezapper uh, is essentially a teleporter. But how you know we've used these in challenges and some side missions and even in the main story missions. Uh, it's probably my favorite part. Our our team did a great job embracing, um, kind of throwing a little bit of a Metroidvania uh, gameplay element into our story. That that sounds like a lot. That sounds like a lot. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> so you, did you, I? Did I? It might, I, be, it might be too I much. That was the one thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, Matt, Bounty of Blood, Fistful of Redemption. It's coming out soon, right? It is coming out very soon. Everybody will be able to play Bounty of Blood on June 25th. It's not soon enough, but we'll, we'll wait. Matt, thank you so much for joining us and telling us about well. the new DLC. Coming up, IGN Summer of Gaming Expo continues with even more new games and reveals. You can follow us on TikTok, send us a yappa, donate, sound off in the comments below, make noise in the chat, whisper softly in our ears. I don't know. You know, you just, you know the drill. When we come back, we'll be exploring the Wayland, so stay tuned. IGN Summer of Gaming is brought to you by Fuser, who will be partying with us all summer long. News, Games, and More is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent, going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us on Mixer.com slash IGN, YouTube.com slash IGN, and Twitch.tv slash IGN. See you there. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. 
follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. Everybody loves watching a speed run of their favorite game. But what if you got the opportunity to peek into the minds of the developers while they watch their games getting completely wrecked? That's exactly what happens in every episode of Game Devs React to speedruns. Yeah, you can do that. Oh my god! <laughs> we invite you to ride along with the developers as they react to, question, and enjoy some of the most skilled players exploiting and speeding through a game it took years of their life to create. Join us every Saturday for a new episode. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and iGen is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. to IGN Expo number one, part of IGN Summer of Gaming. Don't forget to give to the Bail Project and World Health Organization by clicking on the links in the descriptions below to help combat COVID-19 and reunite families. Ah, Sydney. Sydney, Sydney, yeah. Sydney. As the sun sets and the day turns to night, I often lay alone in my quarters, the candlelight flickering around me while I wistfully dream of a simpler time when classical party-based role-playing games were bountiful and aplenty. And then I remember the upcoming classical party-based role-playing game, The Waylanders, and all is right in the world. Huzzah, forsooth. So, uh, Huzzah. so, so keep those donations coming, but, all, but also let's, let's take a look at The Waylanders. The Waylanders is a classically inspired RPG that took its first steps on Kickstarter back in 2018 and has been steadily picking up steam ever since. I recently got to check out an alpha build of the game ahead of its early access launch to explore its fantastical take on the Celtic Age. And yes, that means it is still very much a work in progress. Bugs are still being discovered and weeded out, in-engine cutscenes and conversations still lack animations or lip syncing, and plenty of items and abilities lack descriptions. But this early access version gives us a good look at what to expect from this ambitious and promising RPG. The Waylanders is a unique blend of historical fiction and mythic fantasy, set in the ancient real-world region of Brigantia, but overflowing with supernatural magic. Written by veterans of games like Telltale's The Walking Dead and Fallout New Vegas, its story revolves around what happens when some of that magic becomes corrupted, and how our choices in light of that ripple across history. And while we'll see the consequences of those decisions depicted as the story jumps forward in time to the Middle Ages and back again, the Early Access build is primarily focused on the first Celtic Age segment of the game. Combat, which mechanically feels like the most fleshed out aspect of the build at this stage, is a comfortable take on the classic active pause RPG formula. You've got a party made up of your archetypal warrior, tank, mage, or healer classes that evolve with new attacks, abilities, and subclasses as you level up, but there are a couple of interesting twists. First and foremost is the Waylander's formations mechanic which allows characters to rally other party members into a tight group to perform unique class-based maneuvers against enemies. These can range from historically inspired arrangements like a classical Grecian phalanx to the mythical Sorcerer's Conclave, which transforms them into an arcane siege tower. And selecting which characters in your party are part of a given formation provides an extra layer of strategy too. The more members in a formation, the more damage it can deal or absorb before breaking, but pooling everyone into one big group drastically limits your options. Perhaps instead of channeling the entire party's energy into a magical golem that will stomp all over its foes, you can opt to put three of your five total party members into the Guardian Shield Dome to provide cover as your two spellcasters bombard the enemy from a distance. It's a really flexible system that seems ripe for endless customization and tinkering for you tacticians out there. And that goes for the Waylander's configurable AI as well, which allows you to toggle back your party member's behavior to only take actions you command, or, for those of you who prefer a more casual experience, crank it up so that they'll basically take care of themselves when you want to focus on playing as one character instead of all five. The other notable tweak to the classic RPG style, and this goes for exploration as well as combat, is the Waylander's dedication to making the experience just as enjoyable for players who prefer a third-person perspective as those who want the classic isometric RPG experience. 
Quickly swapping from a top-down or three-quarter perspective to a third-person follow cam with the push of a button is a great quality of life innovation, and something I'd like to see other modern takes on the old-school RPG adopt. And while it's still a bit more cumbersome than a traditional third-person camera, it's still the best execution of the idea I've seen in a genre that's never really managed to get past the really, really zoomed-in ISO cam feel. The option to experience the world from ground level instead of the traditional eye in the sky is something I really appreciate, because what I've seen of the world of the Waylanders so far has been beautiful. From villages surrounded by dense woods to mysterious islands crackling with mystical energy, every environmental pixel is designed to heighten the fantastical nature of Gato's take on ancient Galicia. It's a fascinating mix of old-world historical influence and creative, colorful designs. Blue-skinned humanoid sorcerers with golden metallic eyes sit across the table from Greek adventurers and Celtic kings, while the quote-unquote monstrous Fomorian giants of Irish folklore are surprisingly endearing with their childlike excitement at seeing the surface world for the first time. Holy shit! Yes! The Waylanders looks to be an engaging take on the Celtic mythos, which rarely gets a spotlight in media as it is, and I'm intrigued to see where it ends up once it hits final release. Gato Studios is clearly invested in creating an experience alongside its community, and with a fresh take on RPG systems and its unique world, we'll gladly keep checking back throughout Early Access to see how it's shaping up. Up next on Check Out This Game, we're giving you an early look at The Rift Breaker, a wild mix of an action RPG, an RTS-style base builder, and a tower defense game. Take a look at some exclusive gameplay from its fiery lava environment. Race is under attack. Buildings has been destroyed. Race is under attack. Wall destroyed. Race is under attack. A new technology has been developed. New implants are available for crafting. What about buildings has been destroyed? What about walls has been destroyed? Base is under attack. Like what you see? Then head on over to IGN.com or YouTube.com slash IGN to watch the full extended version of this gameplay. Wall destroyed. Base is under attack. Base is under attack. That was Tom Marks with some info on survival game The Rift Breaker. Wait, you're still here? Well, it's time to GTFO. That's not me being rude or kicking you out. That's actually a video game name that I'm going to tell you about right now. Uh, GTFO is a survival horror first-person shooter that teaches you and three friends a valuable lesson about friendship as the four of you blast the crap out of a bunch of unthinkable horrors while exploring the depths of a creepy facility. Video games, aren't they great?
Believe it or not, this is still just the first of four IGN Expos we put together as part of the IGN Summer of Gaming. Collect them all! And it's not over yet, so don't forget to check us out tomorrow for Expo number two, plus another charity speedrun and Sony's State of Play conference, where I think they're going to talk about a small system called the PlayStation 5. Finally! That would be nice. And don't forget, all summer long, IGN is asking you to give to the World Health Organization and Bail Project charities. The World Health Organization's COVID-19 Response Fund is dedicated to studying, tracking, and combating the coronavirus pandemic. Maybe you've heard of it. The Bail Project is a nonprofit that pays bail for people in need, reuniting families, and restoring the presumption of innocence. Both good causes. Not only that, but by donating, you'll have a chance to win codes for games like Resident Evil 3 and swag from companies like Bethesda. So be sure to check out the donation links in the descriptions of your video player or go to donate.ign.com for more information on how and where to give. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for, we are exploring Mortal Shell, the debut game from Cold Symmetry. This is an action RPG with tense, deliberate combat and punishing enemies set in a terrifying hellscape for players to explore at their own risk. We've got an exclusive trailer followed by your first look at gameplay, complete with developer commentary. And if you like Souls-like games as much as we do, you will not want to miss this. I do. I do not deserve absolution, yet still I seek it. You must find his name. Mortal Shell is an action RPG announced earlier this year that has fans of a certain notoriously difficult game very excited. Right now, I'm joined by the fine gentleman from developer Cold Symmetry. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey. Hi there. Hey. Great to see you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. This game looks awesome. Uh, people are really, really stoked about it. Uh, let's start with the, the shells from the title. Uh, what, are, what are these shells? The shells are uh, the playable characters in the game. Uh, through inhabiting them, you learn more about who they were. Uh, you get in touch with their abilities. Um, but first, you must learn their names. Okay, Indeed, so yeah. And what you see on the screen is uh, Harris, which is one of the first shells you actually acquire. And uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> just wanted to clarify that. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, oh. No, no, go ahead. Their, their abilities, um, you know, they're really, each, each of their abilities are tied in with their storyline. So you might have someone who was an executioner and someone who was a poisoner. And so you'll get, you know, to, to as you get to know who they were when you unlock their storyline, you see here that we're, we're learning who this shell was, uh, what their name was. And each time you unlock a little bit more about their history, you, you get, uh, you, you acquire one of their abilities as well. So how many shells are there, or, or do you even know yet? And it sounds like they're going to be providing different types of play styles. Uh, there are four unique mortal shells that you can uh, discover if you can find them. Indeed, yeah, and, and indeed they do provide different play styles. And as a matter of fact, each shell might even kind of feel like a different game, depending on mm -hmm. if you really fully utilize their combat potential, right? Like one shell. For example, when it comes to dodges and, and rolls, can only roll a certain way. Another shell can only execute a dodge in a certain way. And as Andrew already mentioned, as you discover their uh, discover the abilities and as you learn more about their past and in, in, in terms of the, their lore and history, you will also see how each of those 
abilities really tied in together and in the one specific theme that one shell represents. And the more you uncover, the more you learn what they really, what their strong side really is. Hmm. So you mentioned uh, if you can find all these shells, um, are they sort of uh, doled out throughout the entirety of the game, or is it possible to get all four of them near the beginning of the game so you can use them throughout the entire game? They're they're hidden throughout the world. It's it is close to the beginning, so that you can. Um, so that you'll be able to kind of choose one to which suits your play style the best um, fairly early on, but but you will have to kind of scour that initial area for them. Gotcha. Now, in the announcement trailer uh, that was released earlier this year, it looks like there was a scene where we saw the player get knocked out of a shell. Is that something that can happen during combat? Yeah, that's that's what happens when your HP reaches zero. You mm. you get knocked out of your shell. You're put into this more vulnerable state. Um, it can kind of have tactical advantages, but the big disadvantage is that you only have one HP uh, when you're in that state. So you have to be mm. super careful. Um, yeah, you can get back into the shell a, a limited number of times, um, but uh, but yeah, you've got to uh, really manage your your HP, manage your stamina. Um, and uh, kind of explore all the all the tactics there. But if you're really so, hardcore, you can actually uh, even uh, like play through the game without any shells at all. Like if you really want oh, a challenge, so that's always an option. Yeah, in oh, fact, man. there's, there's like a, a secret spot that you know uh, we hope one of those you know more hardcore players who really want the challenge to find, where you like sort of officially within the game's lore, obviously you renounce the bonding with all the shells it even changes your skin and it kind of like all right it's on now you're gonna live in the age baby <laughs> well, these types of games these types of games definitely have those hardcore uh players that are looking for a challenge so that'll really be fun watching people uh try to do like a no shell playthrough sure yeah yeah so you're being upfront that this is a this is a souls like game uh what made you decide uh to make this kind of game I mean, I guess for us it was never even a question what type of game we want to do because we all are fans of these games, we enjoy playing them, we love the meaning and the philosophy that they have inside, so we just wanted to do something that we would play ourselves and hopefully other people will enjoy too. I mean, the first yeah. time I went over to Vitaly's house, uh, he had this LED screen on his fridge that was, yeah, I'm going there, which is rotating right. <laughs> uh, the armor right. sets. <laughs> rotating the armor sets from Dark Souls 3 uh, like it was oh, pictures wow. of his pets or his kids or something you know and <laughs> and then right after that we had a two and a half hour conversation about uh, debating the merits of nihilism <laughs> oh wow <laughs> yeah very very true I have to admit I had a face I had a face like that and I guess like the the first experience of playing a, a Dark Souls game was really in a way like a life changing for me not just because like you know those are fun games but really the the sense of uh like the overcoming sort of your internal struggle, the journey that you go through and how sort of like character strengthening those experiences are. So in a way, what really happened for us also as a studio, we really bonded also, and you know, over this shared passion and we became real life friends as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, everybody finds something their own on those kind of games. And now, you know, it's a genre that is here to stay. And we thought we have something uh, to say in, in this realm as well. And uh, we really think this is a, those kind of genre, just more than that, just the game that really, they're good for you. So mm. which of the Souls games were the biggest inspiration for you? Uh, I'd say it's probably different for each and every of us. Uh, mm. Like we have a broad selection of uh, games we like in Souls-like genre, but like for me personally, uh, I really love the really old one called Blade of Darkness. Uh, it's maybe like 20 years old even or even more. But uh, it looks like the game you start with when it was first right, sold like is your favorite normally for people, at least among yeah. us. So yeah, it's like the Souls before Souls, right? Sure. Yeah, like before <laughs> yeah. the term was even coined, right? Like the, the first the <laughs> right. original Souls, like and uh, I think you know for some of us, I think Dmitri, Dmitri, did you said what other games you said like even before the Dark Souls? Uh, yeah, we were passionate for uh, dark fantasy art style games different melee combat games like the uh, yeah uh, blades of darkness for sure and it was even uh, golden x and quake one it's not a melee combat but it's still a good uh, it's a pretty deep mood and a style so i was really inspired of that games 
Yeah, and, and sure like, the, like I mentioned, Quake is like it's clearly not a Souls like, but some of the ideas for in terms of the atmosphere and like the world being elements, in terms of like the, the brutal atmosphere, what it brings to, it definitely was an inspiration. Another thing was probably worth mentioning when it, it kind of going back to sort of why we decided is also that there's some elements in the older, in the original Souls like, you know, like the first Dark Souls and Demon Souls that really like that, the kind of like not really being uh, sort of left forgotten today when it comes to like level design and, and some of the other elements that we thought it'd be really cool to take those ideas and evolve them into something new, uh, something that we were passionate about and felt confident that we can uh, evolve on that formula and bring something new to the, to the table. So tell us about the world of Mortal Shell. Uh, what is this place? What happened here? And what is, what is the player trying to accomplish? Well, what exactly happened and what the players tried to accomplish, uh, we tried, we're going to try not to spoil things just yet. Sure. But uh, generally, could, we can say that, you know, the players going to find themselves in this world that uh, was, you know, tarnished and by uh, this influence of the so-called, like, well, we call it in, internally, we're like, we've, in a funny way, referring to the Jews is this substance <laughs> that has almost like magical kind of like abilities that is created and produced within the sacred glance of this godlike creature they revered, the sacred nectar. And this sacred mm -hmm. nectar is pretty much the sort of the root of all conflict in the world, is the main currency that the player is going to use to, uh, you know, to, f to fully uh, develop the combat abilities of their shell, but it's also what other players, uh, sorry, not players, uh, other NPCs and, and uh, enemies also seek in the game. But in general, like uh, speaking, if we baseline it, uh... The, 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 in the game, everybody is basically searching for a meaning. And uh, uh, not only you as a player, but also like other NPCs or other like creatures that populate the world, they're all in search for a meaning. And some of them find it, some of them don't. But uh, it's all about that, basically. What can you tell us about this enemy that we're uh, seeing in combat right here? Well, in general, when it comes to enemies, we try to approach it in a way where every enemy has something about them, something special about them, uh, and one kind of important kind of a pillar design hook idea, right? And also, obviously, has to be integrated in the level within. Like, maybe about this particular fella uh, who's quite mean, and maybe hmm. Dmitry can tell us more about this guy. Oh, yeah. It was fun to make a design for this one. We have a few different versions before we hit the style. But the main idea that we had in mind is like we want to create something a wild, crazy beast, something like a huge hungry bear on steroids. So, <laughs> and... Yeah, because like, you know, it's, it's rare when you see a very well balanced combination of both power, like raw power and fat and speed. And it's hard to get those things right. And, you know, uh, uh, like maybe Andrew can, uh, Anton can talk more about the, the animation side of things and combat there for this guy. Yeah, because that was uh, like part of the creation of the creatures too. Like we we really we don't have any motion capture animation in game, so everything is keyframed, and we're trying to really focus and put like exaggerations and accents in the right moment to make the combat flow in the right way. And same not only not only for enemies but for player too. So it fits together by the end like uh, a Lego pieces. But like we we've been tweaking timings a lot, like frame by frame, to to make sure it works. So how big and how open is this world? The world is, uh, I mean, taking the studio size, we knew from the start that like, we have to focus on the quality rather than the quantity. So hmm. we can call it a fairly compact experience. But when I say compact, I still mean it's like deep enough to get lost in. And it's interesting enough to get lost in. And uh, we have a lot of story storytelling elements and pieces throughout the world. A lot of uh, interesting places to explore where you can find some uh, uh, bits of story that like after that you can connect the dot together and figure out what exactly is happening in in in, in the area that you're in and the the entire experience takes around 20 hours um, I think that uh, you know we tried to keep every moment meaningful like we're not gonna send you around on quests trying to farm rats Right, like we're <laughs> we want you know you're yeah, we're not we don't even really right. we don't really even tell you what to do you know it's kind of up to you and uh, there's a lot to explore you know Vitaly mentioned the roots of like earlier Souls titles like Dark Souls One where we don't give you fast travel right away right so you're you, and you've definitely got no mini map so you're having to constantly um, 
uh, memorize where you are in the environment. And as, as, an, as a result, you get to know it super well. That's right. And the, like you know, the, when the it comes structure. To... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I just want to say that the structure, like the way we build it is uh, uh, like we have one big open area and then the levels that I connect to it and you can choose where to go in any order. It doesn't matter, but we try to make it in a way that it always feels like an adventure, like a journey where you have to commit before you go somewhere in some new area. It might be tricky for you, like you might find it difficult. So you might want to get back and like rebalance, like maybe choose another shell, pick another weapon and try with that. But uh, we try to make it uh, look like every time you decide to go somewhere, it's a commitment and it's an adventure and journey that you have to experience yourself. You're probably going to suffer. You know, you <laughs> you have to. You're going to have the have to have the fortitude to to overcome like that lost feeling that you have in the beginning. But I think once you do, you're going to feel really good about not just about the game but about yourself too. And and I think that we all have gone through kind of similar metamorphosis through playing similar titles that we felt like you know they were really meaningful to us personally. Hmm. All right. Now, getting back to the uh, announcement trailer uh, from a few weeks ago. Did the voiceover guy in the announcement trailer actually say, uh, what is it, bring the glands back to me? The glands? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's that all about? The sacred glands. Uh, I, Vitaly mentioned them earlier. You know, they're really critical to the plot of Mortal Shell, what you're doing in the world. Uh, you know, where, where, where um, there, there are forces fighting over these things. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I kind of get into spoilers here. So you're going to have to, uh, dig in and find out for yourselves. All right. Um, who was the woman in the mask? That's uh, Sester Janessa. She uh, she introduces you to the substance tar, the sacred nectar. Um, she offers you the juice to drink. And that juice <laughs> is what helps you uh, <laughs> bond with your shell, uh, kind of get to know them better, unlock their abilities. Uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, all the all the shells abilities are tied in with their stories. So I think that's that's something that we do that's pretty cool. So what's uh, the current release plan for Mortal Shell? Uh, do you have a, a release window that you're targeting? So we've announced Q3. There'll be more info coming on that soon. Um, okay. Yeah, we're excited to to share that with you when it's time. Well, you guys, Mortal Shell is looking awesome. I know our audience is super excited for it. Before we go real quick, I believe you have a special announcement for the fans that you can make? Yeah, the the we'll be starting the beta on July 3rd and you'll be playing the Crypt of Martyrs. Come and join us in the Discord and uh, see what, what it's all about. Very cool. Yep. What platform will the beta be on? It'll be on PC. Excellent. Cool, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having us. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, before we go, let's take one more look at that kick ass new trailer for Mortal Shell. I do not deserve absolution, yet still I seek it. You must find his name. Well, holy moly, Mortal Shell looks freaking awesome. Might as well end on a high note. We are about done here, but up next is today's edition of News, Games, and More. Well, we will be revealing more exclusive trailers from Arcade 1UP. The summer of gaming still has plenty of excitement in store, though. Three more IGN Expos packed with reveals, more charity speed runs, our celebrity Animal Crossing Island tour stream on June 16th, Sony State of Play stream tomorrow. Just so much stuff. 
So visit IGN.com to check out the full schedule and for even more summer gaming goodness, I love me some gaming goodness, download the TikTok app, follow IGN and check out the hashtag IGN Summer of Gaming where you can watch along with live events and submit your own summer gaming moments, reactions and plays. Plus donate, TikTok, watch, get your summer of gaming on however you want to. We asked you to do so many things and I hope you're not too tired, but just try and do some of them. We recommend drawing the blinds first and just having a great week. There it is. And that is all for IGN Expo number one, folks. Thank you for donating and thank you for watching. We are going to end on one more surprise. Yet another world premiere trailer for a game you didn't even know you wanted yet. Enjoy. IGN Summer of Gaming is brought to you by Fuser, who will be partying with us all summer long. Everybody loves watching a speedrun of their favorite game. But what if you got the opportunity to peek into the minds of the developers while they watch their games getting completely wrecked? That's exactly what happens in every episode of Game Devs React to speedruns. Yeah, you can do that. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> we invite you to ride along with the developers as they react to, question, and enjoy some of the most skilled players exploiting and speeding through a game it took years of their life to create. Join us every Saturday for a new episode. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? We're constantly updating our feeds to bring you the latest news, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, memes, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Snapchat. The next generation of video gaming is on the horizon, and IGN is here to bring you the latest PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news and analysis in our new weekly show, Next Gen Console Watch 2020. We'll bring on the experts to discuss and analyze all the latest developments around these new consoles. From frame rates, services, features, peripherals, and even all the new tech jargon, Next Gen Console Watch 2020 will keep you up to speed on everything leading up to the next generation of gaming. Join us every Friday for a new episode. News, Games, and More is IGN's live news show every day of the week that covers all the day's news about games, movies, comics, and of course, more. This is our daily live show that takes a rotating cast of IGN talent, going over all the latest news of the day while taking live questions and comments from chat. We're live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, and you can find us on Mixer.com slash IGN, YouTube.com slash IGN, and Twitch.tv slash IGN. See you there.
Hey everyone, welcome to News Games and More, the show where we break down the biggest headlines of the day. Lots to digest today. A special exclusive trailer, the day's biggest reveals from IGN Expo. Plus, we've got an exclusive one on one interview with David Hayter, the voice of Solid Snake. Before we get started, a couple of things. First, all summer of gaming long, IGN is asking you to donate to the Bail Project and the World Health Organization by clicking on the links in the description in your video player or by heading to donations.ign.